Thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. Um, we want to take some time to talk to you about suicide and suicide prevention based on uh, the science behind what we know today um, helps reduce the risk of suicide. And I wanted to first thank Dr. Leah Casuto here. Leah is a child and adolescent psychiatrist. She's the brains behind the whole talk. Um, she spends a lot of her time studying suicide reduction, and she goes to lots of conferences and does lots of reading. She also does not like to speak in public at all. Um, and I love to speak in public, but I hate putting together presentations. So I say together we make one fine human being um, and one great psychiatrist. Um, I'm a psychiatrist at the Linder Center. Um, I treat adults in our adult partial hospitalization program. I'm working with patients. Um, six hours a day, 10 to 15 days, most often after they get out of the hospital, and most often times after they have just attempted suicide. And our goal is to keep them moving forward um, to the outpatient setting, to make sure that they're um, not needing to go back in the hospital, to make sure they're safe, and to make sure that they are learning something from what just happened um, in their suicide attempt. And this is Emily Musansa, and she is a recreation therapist at the Linder Center. She works with uh, children and adolescents, and she sometimes covers um, on the adult uh, residential units as well. And she's um, the head of the, uh, the uh, recreation um, therapy. Um, so thank you so much again for coming out. We, we're going to keep this really simple by talking to you about the five R's of suicide prevention. The first one is early recognition. Clearly, there are mental illnesses that put youth at risk for suffering and, at worst, at risk for suicide. At the Linder Center, um, our suicide prevention efforts have been focused on early detection and aggressive treatment of mental illnesses, utilizing evidence-based treatments. Suicidal ideation is a symptom, and, we can, and if we can identify the, the underlying illness or illnesses and treat those aggressively early on, we can positively improve outcomes when it comes to suicide. The next slide shows some of those um, illnesses that are the most associated with uh, suicide or suicidal behavior. The first being major depression or major depressive episode, bipolar disorder or what is also commonly known as manic depression, anorexia nervosa, one of the eating disorders, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, and then substance dependence, substance abuse, or what we call duly diagnosed. And what we mean by duly diagnosed is people that have substance use disorders along with another psychiatric illness or illnesses. When you have a combination of substance abuse or substance dependency, another mental illness or mental illnesses, plus access to a weapon, this highly increases the rate of suicide. And this brings us to our next topic would be our number two. So our number one being early recognition of mental illness and substance abuse. Our number two, removing access. Unfortunately, adolescents attempt suicide quite a lot in our culture. And this is something that I've learned since I've worked with Dr. Casuto here. Um, suicide is attempted much more often by children and adolescents than it is by adults, believe it or not. Um, often it's a response to an argument with a friend or family members due to a situation that uh, the adolescent finds overwhelming and they see no other solution. Hopelessness is a big part of suicidality. Fortunately, in the past, adolescents have died by suicide much less often than adults, even though they attempt more often. And the reason for that is they tend to use less lethal means. This is changing, however, with the internet where kids or anyone really can go on line and learn of methods that are more lethal, unfortunately. Um, children and adolescents attempt suicide 50 to 100 times for every completed suicide, whereas adults, it's 10 attempts for every completed suicide. This is changing, though. And as I mentioned, with um, a lot of information being available on the internet, that gap is narrowing, so fewer attempts and more per suicide and more completed suicides in the child and adolescent group. Um, one thing we want to talk about is uh, guns in the home. And I realize this is a controversial topic for a lot of reasons right now in our, in our communities. Um, the next slide will emphasize this, or the next couple of slides actually. So this next slide is kind of uh, 
it kind of looks chaotic, but um, these are suicide methods in the U.S. This is some 2010 data. For every completed suicide uh, that are, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the most common um, means used for a suicide in 2010, 50.5 percent of suicides that were completed in the United States, a firearm was used. That was higher than any other method. Um, the next being suffocation, which was about 25 percent of suicides that were completed in 2010, and suffocation would include hanging or strangulation. 17.2 percent uh, were completed by poisoning by either solid, liquid, or gas and then 7.8 for all other methods, and they show like a bridge and uh, some knives and stuff on that picture. Um, so any other method uh, that can be used, only 7.8%. So clearly the most lethal means of suicide is firearms. The next slide shows this in a little bit different format, and this is some data from 2017, but it's interesting that the statistics are pretty much the same, and that is that, that bar all the way on the left, um, those are the amounts of suicides that were completed by firearms, and it's by far, in fact, that bar is a, a greater percentage than all the others put together. So that method was the uh, most likely method for someone to commit suicide, a little over 50%. All the rest of them put together were, under, uh, were around 49%, with um, suffocation and hanging being next, cutting being next, and then drowning being near the, near the bottom. So again, showing that Guns are very lethal, and it's a very lethal means, the most lethal means of suicide. Um, the next slide um, talks about this further, and most suicide deaths, like I mentioned, occur um, in the U.S. by the use of firearms. So many people are attempting using other methods, but they're not dying because they haven't used a gun in some cases. Um, children and adolescents are more at risk for suicide, in homes where there are firearms. Guns should be removed from all the homes of children and adolescents, particularly of those where youth are struggling with mental illness, they're having suicidal ideation or prior suicide attempts, or anyone in the house, really, that is struggling with any of these issues. Think of it like this. If you had a family member that was struggling with an addiction problem, say an alcohol problem, and they were in recovery and they were having a hard time staying sober, would you bring alcohol into the house and have it readily available for them, or would you take them to a bar to celebrate their birthday? The next slide looks at this in just a little bit different light, and this looks at case fatality rates in the United States for suicide attempts. And what a case fatality rate is, is if a person attempts suicide, what's the likelihood they're going to die by that method? How many of those, what percentage of those attempts are lethal? And as you can see, again, the top uh, runner here is firearms. If a person attempts suicide by firearms, 82.5% of those people end up dying by suicide. The next being drowning or submersion, which we've already kind of talked about, suffocation or hanging, uh, poison by gas, jumping. Um, so the means in which someone attempts suicide is very important. I see a lot of people every day. I see the people that survive, and I see the people that get another chance. And I can tell you that I would say in most cases, no matter how lethal their attempt was, how unlikely it was that they lived and that they were somehow spared, I can tell you that most of those people, when you sit down and talk to them, they're happy that they survived and they want to move forward, and they want to get help, and they don't want it to ever happen again. The next slide shows um, another important factor when it comes to means, and this is something called the Werther effect. I don't know if anyone's heard of this before, but it involves contagion around suicide. We've all heard some about that, um, but it's particularly a problem in young adults or adolescents. Young people are always, or have always been vulnerable to copycat suicidal behavior. And this was identified and named after a book that was written by Goethe in 1774. So uh, nearly 250 years ago, he wrote a book or a novel called The Sorrows of Young Werther. And in that novel, the main character com completed suicide. And many young men in the community, after reading this book back at that time, attempted or co committed suicide in the same manner. And, there, and that's been identified since that time. So 
one thing that's important is that the media has been given specific guidelines designed to protect from this phenomena from occurring, particularly in youth and adoles youth, adolescents and young adults because of the contagion factor. The media has guidelines by which they're not supposed to discuss the means of a, of a suicide attempt or a completed suicide. And if you think about it, we know some of that information, don't we? When we think of some famous people, I thought of uh, Robin Williams or Kate Spade. We, knew, we know too much of that information. And usually when those things are publicized, there are copycat suicide um, phenomena that occurs. The other thing um, we had thought about was 13 Reasons Why, the movie. I'm not sure how many of you have seen that. But this is some of the objection to that movie, and that is that the main character in that movie committed suicide. And we did see an increase in suicide rates after that movie was aired. Thankfully, though, in that movie, the suicide method was not one that was very lethal. It was by cutting. And if you remember the slides that we looked at before, that isn't one of the more lethal means. So not as many people committed suicide after that uh, aired as we thought were, it was going to be. Um, protect your children from movies, the media, and influences that depict suicide. The recommendations for reporting on suicide and depicting suicide in the media are included in some of the handouts that you guys hopefully got when you came in. I was thinking about this also, and it's also true when we know of people who've committed suicide, particularly young people in school systems. I grew up in rural Wisconsin, and um, there are about 200 people in my graduating class, and unfortunately, two of my classmates committed suicide my senior year, one of them in December and one in January. Um, I can tell you that there were a ton of rumors flying around in our little school about what happened and the method that they used. And I don't know that any of us really knew what, what happened and what was a rumor and what wasn't a rumor. But I noticed the same thing happening. My I have a daughter that's 18, going to be 19 in about four days. And she's now a freshman in college. But in her high school, unfortunately, during the four years that she was there, there were two suicide deaths in her high school. And I remember her coming home and talking about it. And a lot of the things she was saying, I would say to her, how do you know that's true? Where did you hear that from? Um, how do you know that's not a rumor? Because lots of rumors fly around. And sometimes those rumors take, take wings. And um, people think that it, they're true. And they may or may not be. So I was always challenging her to say, unless you've heard that from someone who knows it firsthand, I would treat it as a rumor. And I wouldn't repeat that. Um, and because we really don't know what happened. And we don't want to be perpetuating talk about this, uh, which could give other people ideas. Um, the next slide would be the third R in suicide prevention, and that is reasons for living. Um, protective factors were talked about or are talked about by uh, Dr. Marsha Linehan, who developed a treatment which we use a lot at the Linder Center called dialectical behavior therapy. In fact, dialectical behavior therapy is what's used primarily in the program that I, that I work in, uh, the partial hospitalization program. It's a really excellent program teaching coping skills for life. Really, it could be useful for anyone. Um, part of our work with adolescents who've attempted suicide and adults as well is to identify reasons for dying and reasons for living, almost to make a pros and cons list. Um, we work to undermine the reasons for dying and optimize the reasons for living. And we pay particular attention to items identified by Marsha Linehan, um, who created dialectical behavior therapy. And looking at the next slide, these are um, the things that are contained as the reasons for living on her suicide, I'm sorry, on her risk assessment and management protocol. This list helps us foster reasons for living. So we talk to patients about what do you have hope for in the future? And we talk to them about areas in which they have self-efficacy in, in any kind of problem areas. So you're, you're telling me that you have these problems, but you have these skills. You can resolve these problems on your own. You might need to practice a little bit. You might need some other skills that you need to learn, but you can overcome these problems. Responsibility. Responsibility to others in their life. If it's an adult, maybe responsibility to their children, to their family to others um, that they're close to, including pets who they might not want to abandon. 
And these are important. Some people want to stay alive because they have a little brother, a little sister, or a child, or a pet that, they, that loves them that they need to take care of. Um, another reason for living is that they're embedded in a protective social network or a family, and that their family is important to them, and they're important to their family, and they don't want to leave. Fear of suicide, fear of death, fear of dying, or not, not having an acceptable method. Some people don't want to commit suicide or attempt suicide because they're afraid they're going to mess up. And then if they mess up, they're going to maybe be disabled. And so all of a sudden, all the problems that they already had are going to be magnified because now they're going to have a disability on top of it because they didn't succeed in suicide. And if that's a reason they can come up with for not committing suicide, we go with it and we try and help flesh out some of these other areas. Belief that suicide is immoral or punishable. Some people have strong beliefs in this way, particularly religious beliefs that they will go to hell if they commit suicide. And this might be a really strong reason for someone to not attempt, even though they may be feeling suicidal and be thinking about suicide often. And then high spirituality or religi religiosity, which kind of ties into the one before that. So, like I said, we help foster reasons for living and try and undermine reasons for dying. The fourth R is relationships, and this is an important one. Most often, when suicidal ad adolescents on the inpatient unit at the Linder Center um, want to list for reasons for living, they include their family and friends. When this is not the case, when they're not mentioning family and friends as a reason to stay alive, then we really need to do some interventions to enhance those relationships. A non-deviant peer group. This would be a peer group that your kid is not smoking marijuana with, um, getting into trouble with, um, breaking the law with. A group that's a good positive influence on them has been found in some studies of adolescents to protect against suicide. Supervised church youth groups are a great place to find non-deviant peer groups. In my daughter's case, she was very connected to our youth group, and um, I always say <laughs> the church raised her, because <laughs> the church, I think, did a lot better job than I probably ever could have. And um, I would say that she formed some of her strongest, really healthy peer relationships um, in the youth group in our church. She's still connected to them. She um, comes back home and goes to church so she can see her friends there, even though she's off at college. Um, she's here in town, so she's not too far away. Um, and some of those really strong relationships were forged when she went on mission trips, youth mission trips, and she would be in the trenches with some of the, her peers um, doing some really hard work or being stuck on a bus on a 15-hour trip to somewhere else in the United States or on a plane um, going somewhere on the mission trip with them. So I would say that that's a, churches are great places to have these groups. There are many studies supporting the interpersonal theory of suicide that emphasizes the importance of relationships. Um, an example I wanted to give you from my own life, um, I have a family member that's chronically suicidal who has attempted several times in her life. And I can remember, I think this was after I was a psychiatrist and had some knowledge, I went to her after she had attempted and once things had settled down a little bit. And I said, I have a question for you. When you're in those final moments and you've got the pills in your hand, and you're getting ready to swallow them, because my, my family member, the, the method that she uses often is overdose. Um, when you're in that final moment, what's going through your head? Are you thinking about me? Are you thinking about the family at all? Are you thinking about any of us? And I remember she sat and thought about it for a while, and she said, yeah, I guess I do at some point in there, but I just think you guys would all be better off without me. And depression has a way of doing that. It distorts thinking, and it can make people think. It kind of, the thinking sort of fits along with how you're feeling about yourself. So it makes sense that a person who's suicidal would start thinking that nobody cares about them, that nobody's going to miss them, that everybody would be better off without them. And I said to my family member, looked her right in the eye, and I said, I want you to think about this the next time that you have a handful of pills. I want you to know that that is a lie and a distortion that your brain is, is telling you and that we all care about you, that we all love you, and we would all be devastated if you ended up committing suicide. So think about that the next time. 
And thankfully, my family member has not attempted suicide again after that. I would like to think that that intervention was somewhat helpful. But it was really making the point that you do have people that care about you, you have people that rely on you, you have people that need you, and you have people that would be devastated if you weren't here. The next slide um, talks about work by Dr. Thomas Joyner, Jr. He's one of the most prominent suicidologists today. His father committed suicide, and he has made it his life's work to study suicide. He's developed a theory focusing on aspects of suicide prevention that were previously overlooked. Suicide risk is thought to be heightened when the factors that are listed here on the slide um, coincide along with a desire to die. So failed belongingness. Human beings have a fundamental need to belong. And when they feel that they don't belong, um, that can increase the risk of suicide. Burdensomeness, or a feeling that a person is not uh, able to take care of themselves, um, can also be a factor. And then acquiring the capability to self-harm. And this is an interesting one. It's not that the acquiring a physical capability like enough pills or a weapon or that sort of thing. Um, this is a, acquiring the psychological fortitude to be able to go through with it. So when someone has gotten to that point and they feel like they don't belong, like they're a burden, um, and like they've gotten to the point where they've now gotten up the gumption to actually act on their thoughts, um, this, these are all risk factors. Um, this can be important when someone has attempted, because when I'm working with patients that have just attempted suicide, I see it as this is my opportunity to work with this person very, very carefully to say, hey, let's look at what happened that got you there, and let's make sure that never happens again in your life, or if you do get to that place again in your life, let's figure out how you're gonna take another road than actually acting on the suicidal thoughts. And that's, that's important versus someone who's attempted and who's attempted multiple times, and each time they attempt, they're learning a little bit more about what they did wrong that their suicide attempt wasn't successful, so that they're becoming more and more successful at it as they go along. Um, in his book on interpersonal theory of suicide, Dr. Joyner recommends the use of hope kits as a means of calming distress and reminding us that we're connected to others and that we have a valuable uh, place in the world and we make a valuable contribution. Emily's going to be talking about hope kits after I'm done speaking, and she's going to be telling you how you can use hope kits in your own uh, family with your, your own children. Another very um, interesting research study that has been done is youth-nominated support teams. Uh, Dr. Cheryl King at the University of Michigan developed an intervention for adolescents at risk for suicide. So the study subjects were adolescents aged 13 to 17, hospitalized on a psychiatric unit, with a serious thought of suicide or a plan, or they actually may have attempted suicide. The adolescents were either assigned to random, randomly assigned to treatment as usual, just however they would have normally been treated on the unit, versus those that were in the group that was getting the intervention, they got something called youth-nominated support teams. And what this means is that the adolescent who is at risk for suicide nominated a team of three or four caring adults who were trained by study staff to meet regularly with the adolescent after they were discharged from the hospital. And they were trained by the, by the uh, mental health professionals to provide support for their treatment adherence, you know, making sure that the the youth was taking their medicine, going to their therapy, doing all the things that they were supposed to be doing to help themselves, and helping them make positive behavioral lifestyle choices. These adults were contacted weekly by the study staff and encouraged to have weekly contact with their um, at-risk youth to make sure that they were following up with them for three months. There were 448 young people that participated in this study, and after 14 years, the youth who received the youth-nominated support team treatment were less likely to die than those who did not receive that treatment intervention. Dr. King has submitted a grant um, where she, may, she wants to replicate the study to make sure that the study is showing what, um, what it showed the first time, which makes it much more robust. And the Linder Center of Hope on the Child and Adolescent Unit 
will be one of the um, sites participating in that study if her grant goes through. So we're really looking forward to that. And Dr. Leah Casuto has had a lot to do with that. Um, another uh, issue along these lines is um, sending follow-up letters. There was also a study done that when adolescents were treated and had had a suicide attempt, that letters were sent to them or postcards after they were discharged from the hospital a few months out saying, hey, we're thinking about you. We hope you're doing well. And then it was signed by the treatment team. Um, that was shown to reduce the risk of suicide. And based on that, we're using that in our program. So the adults that come through the program where I work, um, we send them postcards a couple months out. We, we, send, we give them a phone call about a month out. We were already doing that. But now we're also following that up with a postcard. And it's signed by each one of the staff members. To say is says we're thinking about you and we hope you're doing well. If you're not doing well, give us a call. And then that way we have some follow-up with them and contact with them and we can help them navigate where they need to go if they need more treatment at that time. And it tells them that somebody's thinking about them and cares about them. Um, the fifth R in suicide prevention is uh, resilience. And this one I'm going to spend just a little more time on. Um, resilience is the capacity to transcend adversity. Um, Dr. Bridget Daniel wrote a book called Adolescence, Assessing and Promoting Resilience in Vulnerable Children. Many of our youth who attempt suicide do so when they have psychological pain, much self-hatred, and are very stressed and hopeless. Development of resilience helps combat these risk factors. The next slide talks about three building blocks of resilience that Dr. Daniel uh, mentions in her book. That is, having a secure base or a sense of security and attachment, which they would get from home, usually. Um, Self-esteem and self-efficacy, and we'll talk about each of those. These things are considered to be building blocks of resilience, and you can teach resilience to your children. You can actually work on these things to help them be more resilient. Um, and self-efficacy, I looked up the definition of that to, to really get that clear in my mind a belief in one's capabilities to achieve a goal or an outcome. So we'll look at these on the next slide in a different way. So this slide represents um, some ways that we can look at these building blocks by statements. So I'm a lovable person. That's self-esteem. Whenever I see this, I, I start laughing because I think of, um, I don't know, if those of you will remember Saturday Night Live. I think it was Al Franken um, who played this character, Stuart Smalley. He would stand and look in the mirror with his little sweater on and go, I'm good enough and I'm smart enough and doggone it, people like me. And he would start out his day like that every day. Um, but we, we all want to be good enough, we all want to be smart enough, and we all want people to like us. And that's part of um, self-esteem, and it's something that we can work to build in our children. The next is, I can find ways to solve problems. This is the self-efficacy. And I have people that I trust and love, and that's the secure base or secure attachment. This is important because when, when our children um, find themselves trying to solve problems, if they can't figure out what to do, they need somebody to come back to for help. And um, I just have a quick, do I have time? Eh. I was, well, the, the longest story, short of it is my daughter who um, just finished her first semester of college. She took her first two finals on Monday and then she had an 8 a.m. final on Wednesday. She didn't have an 8 a.m. class, but they put her final at 8 a.m. for some reason. She overslept it, woke up, the, the final was from 8 to 10. She woke up at 9.30, freaked out, screaming, crying, freaking out, couldn't figure out what to do, called my husband, and um, he was, um, he, he was saying to her, you know, you gotta, you gotta think clearly here, you know, I can help you think clearly, so go run across campus, try to get to the class, she runs across campus in her pajamas, gets there, there's nobody in the room. Um, she calls him up again, crying and screaming. He says, go over to the, the professor's office. She go, runs over to the professor's office in her pajamas, um, gets there, the professor's not there, the door's closed, nobody there. And then she calls my husband again, what do I do? And he um, says, what, go back to your dorm, email her before 10 o'clock when the final's over, tell her what happened. And it all worked out. The, the um, professor let her take the exam. But sometimes our kids need to you know, come back to us, especially when they're, they haven't faced a certain problem before. Um, so uh, talking about building self-esteem. In our culture, there's so much emphasis placed on appearance, athleticism, and academics. 
A lot of been, work has been done to help build self-esteem in our kids around some more meaningful qualities, like being a moral person, being a good friend, or being a good Christian. The church, of course, is a wonderful resource for this. Supporting this, one suggestion by Wendy Mogul, PhD, in her book, The Blessings of a Skin Knee, talked about the concept of good deed stars. And Dr. Kasuda said that she did this with her children. She's the mother of a 25-year-old identical twin boys. And she used this with them growing up. The idea is that you place glow-in-the-dark stars on their ceiling above their bed every time you um, find them doing something kind or compassionate or moral. And then at night when they're trying to go to sleep, they're looking up at the ceiling and they can see all the stars that, that speak to their many kindnesses. She said just recently they were, were you repainting or something in the, in the room? And so they just recently took the stars down from the ceiling of her, her uh, sons. Uh, yeah, it was the end of their childhood. <laughs> um, Another recommendation is um, to emphasize good deeds around the dinner table. So to talk about not only academics and sports and their other endeavors, but to also catch them doing something good and comment on it and talk about how wonderful it was that they did that and that maybe that might be time to give them the star or whatever method you're going to use. Um, one of the struggles that we have, as parents have is recognizing our our children's unique God-given gifts that are not aligning with the appearance, academic performance, and athleticism that's so promoted by our culture. We can let our own narcissism sometimes um, and our vicarious narcissistic gratification needs that we're getting through our children make, it have, make us have difficulty recognizing and accepting their God-given gifts. In that same book, The Blessings of a Skin Knee, Dr. Wendy Mogul, who's Jewish, talks about Hasidic teaching that says, quote, if your child has a talent to be a banker, don't ask him to be a doctor, end quote. Judaism holds that every child is made in the divine image. Therefore, um, she states, when we ignore a child's intrinsic strengths in an effort to push him toward our notion of extraordinary achievement, we are undermining God's plan. I want to repeat that again because I think that's really important to think about. When we ignore a child's intrinsic strengths in an effort to push him toward our notion of extraordinary achievement, we are undermining God's plan. I think I'm going to skip over this next slide because I'm talking way too long. Um, so the last portion um, is um, talking about enhancing self-efficacy, helping our kids solve their own problems. Um, this gives them confidence. Consider how you deal with your child when they are in crisis or emotionally distressed. Do you rush in a bit too quickly to help them? There's a concept called ultimate frustration. It's just the right amount of stress, or what we call use stress, or good stress that a child can overcome. By experiencing some frustration and then recovering, the child learns that he or she has the ability to overcome adversity. Um, has anybody here heard of the term snowplow parent? Raise your hand if you've heard that. So some of you, so maybe some of you haven't. We've all probably heard the term helicopter parent. A snowplow parent is the parent that goes before their child with the snowplow and makes sure that they remove all the obstacles in the way so that their child doesn't have any problems. And I wonder sometimes what happened to our generation of parents that we have these terms associated with us. Our parents weren't called helicopter parents or snowplow parents. Um, but having a child have ultimate frustration and being able to experience problems so that they can resolve them and feel like they're competent in resolving problems, we can't be a snowplow parent. We have to let them um, have a little bit of pain in their lives, have a little bit of struggle. Um, the other thing, I, the saying I love that I've heard someone say once is our jobs as parents is to work ourselves out of a job. We don't want to be parents forever, but I think sometimes we have a hard time letting go of that role and watching our children grow up and actually take care of themselves. By allowing our children to fail and experience frustration, they develop crucial life skills. Getting rid of our snow plows, we allow our children to experience ultimate frustration, which teaches them that they can endure hardship and overcome failures. 
according to Lithcott Hames, author of How to Raise an Adult. I love this, How to Raise an Adult, not How to Raise a Child. How to Raise an, at an Adult, Break Free of the Overparenting Trap and Prepare Your Kid for Success. Quote, the point is to prepare your kid for the road, not prepare the road for your kid. Um, Oh, I don't have time. I was going to tell another story, but I don't have time for it. Um, so we suggest that rather than rushing to solving your child's problems, ask them some questions, and the next slide talks about that. Ask them if they're calm enough to talk about it. If they're not calm enough to talk about it, you can utilize tip skills. Tip skills are in your handout. Um, I'm not sure if we'll get a chance to talk about that. Um, but it's when a kid is so worked up that they can't think straight. I get like that when my computer breaks down at home. Um, you know, where you get so agitated you can't even do anything to help yourself. Um, when our kids get like this, you know, when your 15-year-old's throwing like a two-year-old tantrum, that's the time to use tip skills um, because they're, they have to calm down first before they can do anything productive to help themselves. But then you can ask other questions when they're calm. What solutions do you have to this problem? What have you considered? Um, how can we break this down into steps? How can you handle this on, or can you handle this on your own? Or who would you go to if you needed help? And then later on, you can ask them what lessons they learned. We asked my daughter what lessons she learned from oversleeping, from using her cell phone um, to wake her up in the morning rather than using the alarm clock that we bought her. Um, and uh, I think she's going to use the alarm clock now. Um, so this is just an example of some questions you can use your own. I'm just going to say really quickly, the uh, last slide is tip skills. Um, this is when your child is so agitated that they can't do anything uh, to help themselves. They first have to calm down. We use this with adults as well. T, t is temperature. If somebody's so agitated, you can have them go stand outside in the freezing cold for a few minutes or put their hand in a, in a bucket of ice water, or put their face in a bucket of ice water, um, change their temperature, and then that actually takes the attention off of what it is they're so agitated about. Um, in, intense exercise, tell them to run around the block as fast as they can. Run in place, do jumping jacks for two minutes as fast as they can. Or progressive muscle relaxation or prayer. And some of these work better for some people and some work better for other people. Um, so this is a way to learn self-soothing, and then once they self-soothe, they can start to solve their problems. Um, so by building self-esteem and enhancing self-efficacy, we can build resilience, which can be protective in children. One thing is for certain, human behavior is terribly and wonderfully complex. Despite our best efforts, we sometimes lose people to suicide, even the best psychiatrists do. Please be compassionate with yourself and with others if this occurs. There is a good body of research to support the five R's that we've talked about as a means of reducing suicide, early recognition, removing access, reasons for living, relationships, and resilience. Overall, early recognition of illness, aggressively treating chemical dependency, making a safe home free of guns, helping children to develop, to develop positive relationships, and resilience, including self-esteem, grounded in spiritual beliefs can do much to reduce the risk to improve the quality of life and help protect against suicide. Thank you, and now Emily's gonna talk about um, some, some things that you can do at home with your kids to help. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about creating a personal hope kit. Um, so my work is done on the inpatient unit, mainly with uh, kids and adolescents, and this is one of the groups that I try to do on a weekly basis. Um, so we learn how to create our own hope kit, um, which kind of follows along the reasons for living, um, but also things that you can do to help yourself in a crisis moment. So everyone's hope kit is different. It's personal to them. Um, and it's supposed to be reminders of things that bring you joy, happiness, things that relax you, calm you down, or things that you just like. We all like something different. and. There's no reason why we like it, we just do. So these are all tangible items. So these are gonna be things that we can actually hold and see and do. So you get kind of a shoe box or a bigger tote and we work our way through all five of the senses and we try to come up with items for each of them. So we start with the sense of sight. What are things that we could use? So a lot of times we focus on photographs from a, a family vacation, photographs of an event that was really 
happy and special for us, people in our lives, um, maybe stubs from concerts or ticket, uh, movie tickets, you know, times where we had a really good time with friends or family, our favorite books, magazines, things that we enjoy. Now this is where it gets tricky because we live in a very digital world now, so we want to put like our favorite movies and TV shows, but most of those are on Netflix and that's not a tangible thing. So um, if you do own a copy of your favorite movie, you know, that can go in there. Um, inspirational quotes, positive affirmations, things that we can write to ourselves. Um, those can go in there. And then we move to sound which is also where we fall in the same digital world because a lot of kids now are using Spotify and YouTube and that's not tangible. Um, but um, putting some of our favorite music, um, our favorite songs, artists, and then other things like relaxation sounds. So CDs of beach waves, nature sounds, they have sound machines, things like that can go in there, things that could be calming to you relaxing. Uh, when I do this group, people always want to put, well, I want to put my mom's voice, which you really can't. So maybe phone numbers, a list of phone numbers of people that you could call um, and, and talk to, kind of your support people. And then for, for smell, we talk a little bit about aromatherapy. Um, we use aromatherapy as a helper. Um, so calming scents like lavender, chamomile, vanilla, and how are we gonna get those? So those diffusers and oils are very popular right now, very easy to find at many stores. Um, or candles, lotions, a lot of bath products, you know, bath bubbles, um, the bath bombs, anything that could be relaxing, something to actually use. Or scents associated with a positive memory, so your mom's perfume or something like that, something that would bring about good feelings for you. And then for taste, uh, the research, we don't wanna put food in this. So mainly because you might not use it for a while and you don't want it to go bad. But the research really talks about things like calming things, so like a favorite hot tea, so put those tea bags in there, uh, your favorite coffee. If you have a favorite soda, put one of those in there. A special treat, if you have a favorite dark chocolate or candy, or a favorite candy from when you were a little kid, so like gummy worms or something kind of fun. And then the last one is touch, um, and that can be so many different things. So the fidget items, stress balls, um, all those things are really popular right now. You can find them at a lot of different stores, the putty, that kind of stuff. But then these are also things you like to do. So if you play a sport, you know, the basketball, if you are a runner, your running shoes, if you play an instrument, you know, your drumsticks, your guitar pick. But then other small things too, if painting your nails, you know, so your nail polish, doing your hair, your hair stuff, if you like to write, color, different things that remind you, okay, I'm gonna relax, I'll sit down, I'll color this picture. And then some of like the word games, the Sudokus, crossword puzzles, all those different things. I um, mean, you put them together in a box and you wanna make sure this box is accessible so you're not gonna shove it in the back of your closet or way under your bed, but put it somewhere where you know that that'll be easy to get to. Um, and when, you see kind of the struggle starting, the anxiety coming up. We pull out the hope kit and we start working through it. So what are some things that can calm us down? What are some things that are gonna remind us to focus on the positives? And then that, that's kind of, you, you work through it. And then when your crisis ends or you soothe, you kind of put it back away and, and use it. And I think it's something that you can grow with. So as we grow, we add new things to it because our interests change. But it's something that can grow. Um, and like I said, we live in a very digital world. So there's actually an app that you can put on your phone. And it's listed here on your handout. And it's called a Virtual Hope Box. And it was created by the same people that did the research behind the Hope Kit. 
And when you put it on your phone, you open it up, and it has a lot of different sections. They've actually updated it a little bit recently. So there's positive quotes to flip through. You can link your music to it so you can make positive playlists. It has Sudoku crossword puzzles. You can actually upload um, a personal picture and turn it into a puzzle and work that out on your phone. So I know a lot of times I talk to the kids and when they're at school or they're out with their friends, they're like, I'm not carrying my Hope Kit with me everywhere I go. But most of them have their phone. So it's something that, that you can put on your phone and have access to wherever you are. And then the second um, kind of coping skill that I like to use a lot is creating a daily gratitude journal. So we talk about gratitude. I mean, we really break it down to very simply things that made me happy today, things that made me smile today. Um, and so every day you get a journal and the goal is to write three things, no matter how your day was. So if one of your gratitudes is, I went to school today, that's your gratitude. I made it through the school day. Um, we focus on daily simple things like enjoying a conversation with a friend at lunch, um, getting a good grade on a test, things like that. And every day, you add three more uh, to the list. Now, I know a lot of kids keep a, a journal anyway, so we always keep our gratitude journal separate from any other journal. That way we can just kind of create this list of positive things that are happening for us. And I was thinking, how else could we use a gratitude journal? Because it's something that could be easily shared. So maybe that could be nightly discussion at the dinner table. Everyone has to share their three positives for the day. So what are three things that were good for you at, um, today? And everyone goes around and shares their three. Um, but there's also many, many apps. I don't have a specific app for the gratitude journal I recommend. If you go to your app store and just type in gratitude journal, You'll get all kinds of stuff for free, stuff you have to pay for, but they're all the same concept of, they kind of just have bullet points, you type it in. Some of them do give you more prompts to read and things like that, but um, it's kind of up to you what you want. So those are the two kind of big coping skills um, that we use to help uh, teenagers, but these are also really great for anybody, adults as well to use um, to help overcome some stressful moments in life. Well, let me begin uh, by saying my name is Chad. I'm the, uh, one of the lead pastors here at the church, and it is just a real honor to be here with each one of you. And I certainly know firsthand through a family and extended family the challenges of um, just the burdens of dealing with mental health issues. In my family and extended family, we have severe ADHD, we have autism at you know, extreme level autism, uh, we have depression, I've got a family member with survivor guilt from having lost his whole platoon, um, PTSD for 30 years. Um, so we have family members on all different levels of mental health at all different ages. And so I'm a fellow traveler with you, and uh, in being a fellow traveler with you, I'm gonna promise you I don't have any silver bullets. <laughs> Because if you've tried to work through this together, you know it's just hard. It's just hard. And so I want to, as a uh, fellow caregiver, I guess, give you some things that might help. And some things you're going to like, hey, that helps a lot, and that won't really work for us, and that's going to be okay. But mostly what I want to give you is hope. Hope that God is with you in the midst of your challenges and how you can instill hope in those that you're caregiving and helping along with. For us, you know, we adopted a son with autism 10 years ago, and it kind of put a bomb in our life that even those of us who didn't struggle with depression started struggling with depression, just trying to spin and keep all the different pieces. So whether you're dealing with your own depression, you're dealing with a postpartum, whether you're dealing with a midlife crisis, whether you're dealing with a family member with addiction, I just know it's hard. So I just want to begin by praying hope into you. And then we're going to bring some just lots and lots and lots of practical things that might help, or you might want to go not that one, but this one. But we're going to be extremely practical here for the next 30 minutes together. Let me pray for you. Father, each person here has come with a load, a burden, a burden that only a caregiver knows. And Father, we thank you that you give a promise to every caregiver that you are with them that they are not alone, that you love the person they're caring for more than they do. 
And not only are they not alone, Father, but I would ask that you would be very close to them right now. You promise, Father, that you are an ever-ready help in tight places. And many of us have come into this room feeling like we're in a very, very tight place. So, Father, will you just whisper in your spirit? Will you speak into each person's heart even now and just say, I am with you. And I will work all things together for good. Keep trusting me. Keep following me in the midst of the challenge. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, the Bible speaks a lot about hope. There's a verse in Proverbs that says that when hope is deferred, it makes the heart sick. When you don't have hope, when a child doesn't have hope, when a family member doesn't have hope, something to look forward to, it makes your whole body sick. In fact, the Bible describes us as triune beings. And as triune beings, we have a body, we have a spirit, and we have a soul. And our soul is composed of three parts. And that is our, our feelings, our thoughts, and our will. You know, what I think, what I feel, what I want. And what always causes suicide or depression is always believing a lie. And being a Christian allows you to have a very holistic view of dealing with mental health issues because we believe that all three of these can be impacted. So sometimes your body chemistry is out of whack and there's nothing wrong with getting medicine to get your body chemistry, your, your serotonin back in place, your different chemicals depending on who you are, or hormones back in place. So holistically, because we believe human beings are three parts, there's nothing wrong with taking medicines to help because when your brain's functioning better physically, it allows your soul, what you think, feel, and want to function better. And God says that when he, you become a Christian or invite God into your life, it doesn't magically solve everything but it does give you an engine that you can use. And ultimately what causes suicide is always lies. You start believing lies about God, lies about yourself, lies about the world. Sometimes lies about the world say things like, you know, life should be a vacation. And you're like, but it's not. I want to talk a little bit about that and some of the specific truths uh, I worked with my daughter on when she was in 10th and 11th grade that helped her with some of those thoughts about how the world should work. Sometimes they're, they're feelings. I don't feel like I matter. I don't feel like I belong. And so the Bible talks about taking thoughts captive and renewing your mind and speaking truth into those people that we love and allowing God to speak truth into our, in our lives as well. So it's a very holistic approach that allows you to address both your spirit, your soul, and your body in dealing with mental health and how do we put hope in. In fact, there's a verse in Romans that says this, may the God of all hope fill you with all joy that you may abound in hope. It's like, well, yeah, I, I'm trying to give hope, but this person it won't take, it's not getting in. And then you start wearing out and you start losing your hope. So how do we abound in hope ourselves, keep ourselves filled up, as well as connect our families to hope as well? So I wanna give you some hopeful categories you can use for yourself and the people you care about. The first is I think that everyone is hoping, looking for, and longing for someone to listen. Now you might say, no, you don't know my son, you don't know my daughter. <laughs> I try making conversations, the answer is, yeah, nah. So, so I wanna talk about some strategies and tools that can tie in to deep underneath that really our people are hoping that you will listen and they will be listened to. Working with teenagers for about 15 years as a youth pastor, I never once heard a teenager say, my parents listen too well. Not once. Now. I'm not saying all the parents did a bad job, right? I'm a parent, I've got a 22-year-old, I've got a 20-year-old, and I've got a 10-year-old. But the perception is that we don't listen well. And having done marriage counseling and family counseling for many, many years, I would say we could all be better listeners. And so one of the tools I wanna to put in that can help you as you learn how to listen, to check in with your kids, and check in with your, you know, your significant other, is number one, one of the best ways to start that conversation is just say, hey, I went to a seminar on Sunday night, and I realize I'm not a great listener. Can I talk to you for a moment? Right before you go to bed, can I talk to you for a moment tomorrow? And just start by saying, I'm sorry I haven't listened well. And I know I haven't done a great job. I'd like to start over. That spirit of humility, even if you feel like you're only 10% wrong <laughs> and they're 90% of the problem, own that 10%. When you bring humility into the conversation and say, I'd like to try some new things because I want to be there for you and I'm not exactly sure how. So can we try something? 
And then this is, uh, we did a series several years ago that passed out this tool, but here's a tool you can use. If you flip to the page that starts off with the character qualities, you'll see on the second to last page it says soul words. This will at least not give the person the option of saying yeah or nah. So you can hand out those soul words and say, hey, listen, I want to know how to listen better, and I know I'm not particularly good at it. So this is a tool I want to try, and it's going to kind of fumble through it, but just know this is me trying to enter your world. What's going on? Because I care. Could you look at that list of soul words? What are three things that you're feeling this week? Because I just sense, I'm, I'm concerned. Can you just pick three different words? Take a few minutes. Pick three words that you're feeling right now. Now, while you're thinking about those words, the page before that is a listening guide on how you can learn how to listen. These are the questions you can ask. So you hand them that page, and here are the questions. It starts with prompting event. Share with me one thing that's stressing you out or causing you to have feelings. Can you identify what you're feeling? Point two, using that list of soul words, please share with me the top three feelings you're having regarding this right now. So give them a moment. Person comes back, well, I only have one. I'll just, I know this is awkward. I know this is difficult. But listen, I'm really trying here. And sometimes creating the right moment for this is important because when it comes to listening, it often comes down to tears, timing, and trust. And timing, depending on your teenager, depending on your spouse, depending on your uncle or your sister-in-law, there's a time of day you got a better chance of listening to them, isn't there? I mean, my mom was a master at this. I mean, she knew if she wanted to listen to me, uh, she pretty much had to stay up to about 11 at night. That's what the time was that I was most open to talking. My son Javen is that way. If you want to really have a real conversation, it's going to have to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to have to be two of us alone. It's probably going to have to be late at night. So find the right time for this. Bring humility to the table. So here's a tool I want to try because I know I've been great at this. Could you share with me three words of how you're feeling right now? Just have them share. Well, I think, I don't know, I think it's overwhelmed, crushed, and invisible. And you're not judging, you don't have to agree with what they're feeling, but what you're trying to do is identify what and why. And so your follow-up question, again, that listening guide is, can you rate those feelings? So you said invisible. Scale one to ten. How invisible are you feeling right now? Ten being so invisible, one being not at all. Eight. Eight. Wow, what's making you feel invisible? You're trying to identify what they're feeling and the why, what's causing it. And again, listening, it's hard not to react as a parent, as a spouse, as a kid, as a friend. So try not to react. My goal is to listen. The Bible says be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry. And like what comes naturally is the opposite, right? We're, we're quick to speak, well, you know, that's, you shouldn't be doing that. Quick to get angry, and we don't listen very well. So I want you, as you start this conversation, the goal is to be an investigator to understand where they are, not to make value statements about it, to communicate warmth and empathy and respect. So first question, hey, what's going on right now? You know, can you just pick off that list of, of three emotions you're feeling? Two. Scale one to 10, where are you at on that? Three, what do you think is causing you to feel that way right now? And I'm not saying that every time you have that conversation, it's gonna be awesome, because it's not. But if you start the pattern of, of putting that discipline into your life, every third one might be good, every fifth one might be good, and better to have 20% than to have none. Because often knowing where the people struggling with discouragement and depression are, if there's not some kind of an attempt to tap into what's going on beneath the surface, you're never going to know. And kind of like when you first learned to type, it was a lot easier when you used to hunt and peck. It's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel like, oh, this is kind of weird. Embrace the weirdness. Because you're trying to make an attempt to tap in. And you admit, listen, I'm not good at this. This is a new tool. The pastor told me to do it. Whatever it is you need to do, make that your excuse to try and tap in to where they're at and what's going on. Learn how to ask great questions. And this is kind of a tool for doing that. Two, people are hoping for courage. We all know the word encourage, which is to put courage in someone. When you're going through a difficult time, when your family's going through a difficult time, they need you to encourage them. They're hoping that you will put courage into them. So how do you do that? Sometimes it's real simple. It's as simple as a text, a note, a personal uh, note you put you know, with them before they head off to school, whatever it is. But it's, hey, we're going to get through this. 
Hey, I know that was a tough conversation we had last night. I want you to know I'm for you as your dad. I'm proud to be your father. I want you to know I love you. We're going to get through this together. You're going to get through this. I know you can do it. To almost put on your list, how can I shoot a quick text, send a quick note to encourage, to put courage in because it is hard, hard, hard to deal with depression. Now, it's hard to deal with someone with depression, right? <laughs> it's one thing to say, well, that's hard. You've got to try dealing with it. Agreed. But it's hard to be in depression where your brain is just magnetized toward negative thoughts and those ants, that automatic negative thinking syndrome is just everything gets sucked in. And so part of what we're doing is we're trying to encourage, put courage in, that we're going to get through this together. You're not alone. And it's as simple as that, just a text, a note. You leave the uh, kids on the way to school, you send that text, you send that email, whatever's the best format, and you're just going to say, hey, we're going to get through this. You send a quick verse, and I'll give you some verses that you can send or pray for as well. But you're trying to put courage into them. The book of Thessalonians says this, comfort each other and edify, which means to build up one another as you're going through challenges. So pick your timing well, but find ways to do that. Now, my parents did a phenomenal job at this. It made it very easy for me to, mod- to repeat it. I have personal notes from my parents when I was in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, went on a mission trip, page letters from my parents. Now that we've just gone on video as a church service, my dad watches our services every week from Groveland, Illinois, and after my 10 o'clock service, I get a note from my dad, awesome job today, Chad. Do you think I've grown out of the need to hear from my dad? Do you think your son or daughter, as much as they're messed up and think they hate you and say terrible things and throw fits, do you think they've grown out of the need to hear good words? They've heard speeches, right? We all give speeches and they don't listen. Make excuses, make a habit, make a discipline of a quick text, a quick note, an email. In fact, there's several stages in parenting that are particularly significant in us being able to shape our kids. One of the fourth big windows is age 18 to 21. And so the research shows that if you can speak words of affirmation into your kids during that time period when they said, oh, finally I'm out of here, can I really do it? Can I really do it? Your ability to speak into their life is going to speak to that ability that they can do it. So when both my son and daughter were in college, my wife, when we were going to bed at night, as we were getting ready for bed, I would say, hey, let's write a note. Every six months we'd write a note to Jave, and every six months we'd write a note to Sierra. Man, we love you. We're so proud of you. Now, my wife is not nearly as verbal as I am. So usually I was writing it and saying, hey, what do you think of this? I was throwing in a line or two from her because it was much more helpful for me to write it and her to kind of put the pieces in place so that we could send it together. So every six months we send an email and the sole goal was not advice, wasn't we don't like what you did, wasn't we don't think, the sole goal was to bless and to instill, we believe in you, instill courage of where they were in their life. And maybe you never got a letter like that from your mom or your dad. What an incredible opportunity you have with all the fights and all the differences going on to have a note, to have a conversation, to have, and they might start short, but to speak words of life, to edify or to build up one another. In fact, we just started, my, my daughter got married last year, and so we've just added my son-in-law to the list. So we just wrote our, our first one to him two months ago, and I got this incredible uh, email response back just of incredible gratitude and joy and thanksgiving for how we've invested in him and, and he's you know age you know, 24, 25 and, and you know he's making some big decisions and you know he's involved with, with, uh, with you know kind of how his career's going and we got to also instill courage in him and it's hard when you're beaten down by everything else to think oh I could use some encouragement yeah you could right wouldn't you love to get a note like that well God wants you to know he's for you And he loves you. And he is so proud of the work you're doing. 1 Corinthians says, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And many of you are being steadfast. And you're being immovable. And you're doing the work of the Lord in some trenches that like nobody wants the trenches you're in. I want you to know God is for you. And God wants to put courage in you. That he is with you and he's fighting with you. You're not alone in this. You feel that? That's what the people hurting your life want to feel as well with a personal note written to it. In fact, so that's encouragement. How do we put encouragement? You see, our kids can't see our heart. Oh, I feel so good. I I love my son so much. I love my daughter so much. Yeah, but they can't see your heart. They can only see your calendar, and they can only hear your words. 
if you're really honest about what percentage of time the words coming out of your mouth are a lecture that they need versus words of blessing that they need, what if we just move the pendulum a little bit to encourage them and to help them? Another way that you can encourage people is through prayer, which is why I began today by praying for you. Something powerful about prayer. For some of you, this is going to be easy to do. Some of you to say, this is never going to work. But when you see a son or daughter or family member who's going through a difficult time and you're worried about them, just ask the question. Hey, man, sounds like, hey, buddy, hey, whatever, you know, your kind of pet name is for your kids. Um, hey, buddy, and ask the question, do you mind if I pray for you? Now, you might have a sense, no, no, pray for me, all that religious crap. You know, you, you can get that. And that's like, you say, hey, that's okay. <laughs> that's totally okay. But I tell you, most of the time when I've asked people, family members, can I pray for you? Oh, please. Most people I know have never had anyone pray for them. And most people have not prayed for anybody, like out loud. So just ask the question, do you mind if I pray for you? I guess. Whatever the answer is, it's not no. It can be a real short prayer of encouragement. God, thank you that you are with them. Thank you, you're with John. God, thank you that you love John. Thank you that I love John. Thank you that I love Steve. God, and be with them. Help them depend on you because they are so loved. Amen. It can be short. One sentence prayer. We got several caregivers because I've got a son with autism, so we have a lot of caregivers that flow in and out of our house. A lot of them are 20-year-olds who just have a lot of chaos and a lot of pain going on in their life. And so before they leave as a caregiver, I'm always like, hey, what's going on? Hey, before you leave, today, anything going on that, that uh, you know, we could just would want us to know about? And just that simple question, I can't tell you how many times I hear 20-year-olds saying, oh, my goodness, yeah, I'm overwhelmed with this. And I have no idea if they're religious or not, but I ask the question, well, I don't know if you're a praying person or not, but do you mind if we pray for you? I've not yet had a no. I'm not saying people won't say no, but oh, please. I pray for caregivers in my house all the time because people want some outside source of encouragement, some outside source, someone cared enough to ask, and someone wanted to pray and put something in me. So do that. Put something in. I've done it for family members. I had two of those just today, two of those this week. I had a guy who called up in the army wanted to commit suicide. He's on the phone. He put three notes into us, and he said, listen, I need to hear from somebody. And as he was talking, I get to it. One of the things I address specifically, but I say, do you mind if I pray for you before we begin? Yes. And, I, and my prayer was a little bit longer, but I was coming against the lies. God, I, I've heard this guy, I won't give you a name, but you know, he just said that he is feeling like he's worthless and life isn't worth living. God, we come against that lie. We reject that as a lie, Father. And we just want to acknowledge that he is loved by you and you're going to help him get through this. Amen. Short prayers. Tapping people in, not just to your encouragement, to God's encouragement. I'll come back to that when I get to Scripture in just a second. The next thing is that people are hoping for a blessing. People are hoping not only for courage, but for a blessing. People want to be blessed. And what is what I mean by blessed? A blessing is not just love for what you do, but for who you are. Nobody wants to just be a paycheck or the person who scores goals or the person who's good at ballet. All those are nice things. But to go deeper is to bless you. I love you for who you are, not for what you do. Oh, you felt this in, in your marriage, haven't you? Well, thank you, honey, that you bring home money for us to pay for stuff, which is nice to hear. Like, is that all I am as a paycheck? Yeah. Thank you, honey, last night that we made love. Is that all I am as a bedroom partner? Right? So there's nothing wrong with saying Thanksgiving about that, but to go deeper is to thank people for who they are, not just what they do. And so I want to tell you how to do that. And here again is a tool. And make excuses to do this. But on the, on the first page, I gave a list of 175 character qualities. Okay, so take this with you, and let me show you how you can do this to be a blessing to someone. We just did this recently for my son when he turned 20. So we had a family dinner, and I said, hey, before family dinner, um, we're going to have a moment. Uh, a moment? What's that? You know, call it whatever you want. Make it up, right? But we're going to have a moment. Javen, come on in here. We want you to sit in that chair. So he's sitting in that chair in the living room, and I passed this out to everybody. This was you know, my daughter, my son-in-law, grandma, grandpa, and uh, Beth and I. I said, I want everybody to take a moment, and I want you to circle three words on this list of positive things you see in Javen. Javen's like, oh, do I have to? Yep, yep, you have to. Yep, you have to just sit there for a moment. We're going to encourage you. And so we went around and we, we circled the different words and then we just went around the room. So it's only going to take a few minutes. Um, I'll go first. And then I actually bought from Home Depot, um, some from uh, Michael's, uh, a two and a zero for his birthday. And 
I went around and I said, I'm going to pass these around and I want you to write on these numbers the, the things you saw in Javen with different color markers. And then I want you to just say out loud, it can be real short if you're not a real verbal person, it can be long if you want to, I'll probably be long, what they were. And so we just went around the room. Hey, Javen, I noticed and hear the words, how intelligent you are, how genuine you are, how hilarious you are, how kind-hearted you are. Next person. Well, I wrote down that you're resourceful and clever and witty and elaborated. And my wife said some words, and I said some words, and grandma said some words, and dad said some words, and sister said some words, and brother-in-law said some words. And now these have become something that he puts on his wall. If he ever hung it up, which he hasn't since his birthday. But if he was going to hang it up, that's what it would be. <laughs> but he gave me permission to bring it tonight. How often do the people around you who know you best speak words of life into your life? And we have the opportunity as parents to create excuses, create family traditions, make up stuff. We always do this. That's what all parents do, right? You make it up. But create excuses at every single graduation, every single moment you can, every single family dinner, once, whatever it is, make excuses to bless the people in your life because we are in a culture that is longing for connection and longing for blessing. So find ways to do that. Find ways to bless because I'm telling you, all of us long and need and want people to speak words of blessing to our life as well. Uh, next, when it comes to blessing, listen to the questions you ask. Are you always asking about what'd you get, what'd you get, what'd you get, what'd you get, what'd you get on tests? Are you asking, how you doing, how you doing, how you doing? What are you excited about? What are you concerned about? And I'm telling you, this is gonna take very strategic timing and different, each kid's gonna be different. And part of that is to create moments. And sometimes seasonally that's different. So for me, I, for example, go skiing at Perfect North two or three times a week um, all through the ski season for the last 18 years. And so I, I take my son my daughter skiing with me. We go to Perfect North once or twice a week. And I know that on the way there, it's no phones on the way there or back. You pick one, and that's a time to talk. When they were young, it was sitting in the hot tub. Oh, when it was time when they were playing soccer, it was on the, on the way to soccer when I only had one of them in the car. They try to strategically use that moment to, to find a way to bless them. Hey, man, I was just thinking how much I love you, how much I appreciate you. <laughs> See, you don't have to add stuff to your calendar. Look for strategic things in your calendar that you can say, I need to turn this moment of a car ride into a blessing moment. Or sometimes you want to create disciplines. Because every time we went to Perfect North was not a great conversation. But I tell you, you go up that ski lift enough times, there's a lot of time to talk, and it's a time to check in. When we get in the hot tub every night together, I use this as a time to check in. Hey, what's going on? Anything bothering you? Has dad not kept his promise at all? Anything I need to know? See, we gotta create the moments so that we can bless, so that we can listen, because life just moves too fast that if you don't create the moments, they're not gonna be there. So create the moments that we can bless, that we can speak into, that we can talk into the kids and into our kids' lives. I had one of those great conversations with my son last week. We just, my son, Javen, and I were on our way to uh, ski, just the two of us. I didn't have Quinn with me, didn't have anyone else with me. And again, on the way there, I said, hey, can I share something with you? And we just had this great, deep emotional conversation that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't just been a little bit intentional. And yet I can tell you, I've had 80% of other times I've tried it and it didn't work. So keep on keeping on. It's worth moving to find the heart of those we love. Another tool that I put it as a, just a picture of the book... Uh, at the last of this, this pamphlet is a book called uh, The Thousand and One Complete Book of Questions. I've been using this for probably 15 years. It's by a guy named Gary Poole. It's just a thousand and one questions. Sometimes we'll be driving in the car, I'll say, somebody give me a number, 175, and I'll flip over to 175. If I don't like the question, I take anything off the page. <laughs> what do you consider your best quality, 175? Hey, Sierra, what do you consider your best quality? And I'm gonna use whatever this is Whatever the question is, I want to answer it so they get to know me, and then I'm going to turn it around and find a way to bless them. That's an easy one to do. Another one. What fear would you like to overcome? It's just a simple tool that you can use. In fact, I get the PDF so I can keep it on my phone so I don't have the book with me all the time. And I did it with my kids. I did it with my kids' friends because I wanted to get to know them. And the lower the numbers, the more shallow you are. So it's always funny because I told them that. So some, some of my friends would always pick the low numbers, some would pick the high numbers. But it's a simple little tool I've been using for many, many years to create those moments. Another way that we've been doing this for years, in fact, we're on to our second one, is we have this red plate that we use. And so we write down every time there's a God sighting, every time we see God answer a prayer. I'd heard the kids um, 
especially teenagers, don't ever see that God works anymore. He used to work in the Bible. And so every time we have something to celebrate, we pass the red plate around and people sign you know, what they saw God do and we try and celebrate together. Now, 80% of the time family dinners aren't great. <laughs> They're just not emotional. Woo, yeah, it's wonderful. Look at everybody's open up. All right, so, so I'm trying to be real sick. But, but, but when we try it, I don't know if we're hitting it 20% of the time or 30% of the time, but when it's great, it's great. And I got to have a whole lot of failures in order to have some stuff that works great. And sometimes that's celebrating other people. Like here's grandma and grandpa who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Here's, here's a first job. Here's acceptance into, into college, uh, the college that we wanted. Here's a, a Miss Hard Work You that my daughter. They're just excuses to bless and celebrate the people in your life. So, so whatever it is for you, make excuses to do it. All right. So that is blessing. And a little more time. Another thing that, and we're going to get some harder stuff now, hoping for structure. Um, no one's going to tell you who's struggling with an addiction or struggling with um, depression that they're, they're hoping for structure, but they are. It might be deep down there. When somebody's on a destructive path, at some level they know it. In fact, there was a, a study done several years ago called the uh, Reuben, Minnesota Report. And in that report, it showed what type of parenting produced the most secure kids. And so what we found is that those who had high structure... Where are you? Where are you going? Let me check. But no emotional clo closeness. Okay? High structure, but no emotional clo closeness. Don't care about you. Don't get to know your heart. Don't ask you questions. Just, you know, just do it. Do it because I said so. This group caused the most amount of rebellious kids. The most rebellious. If I could spell rebellious, which apparently I can't. All right. They caused the most rebellion. Even with all that structure, because there's no emotional closeness. On the other hand, there's another group that had high emotional closeness. Oh my goodness, oh, I love you, love you, here, love you all the time, encourage you all the time. No structure, you can do whatever you want. These created the most insecure children. Because they had all the emotional closeness, but they didn't have any structure. What's right, what's wrong? The most secure children were produced by those who had high structure and high emotional closeness. That's where the most security is. And when a child is struggling with their own thoughts, depression, struggling with addiction, their brain is not thinking right. And so if you're like, well, I hope they come, in, I hope they come around. They're not going to come around without you imposing some structure on them. And you've got to love them enough to say, I've got to put some structure. We've got to get you some help. We've got to go to the doctor. We've got to do this. I've got to take stuff out of the house. Whatever that is, I've got to impose some structure on because we're in danger zone. Warning, Will Robinson, warning, right? And sometimes those are real tough conversations. I've interviewed people here on this stage who've gone so far as to have a child who was so out of whack, they actually had to have a company come in and take their child away to Idaho for months to get them off an addiction. And you're like, what kind of a parent would do that? The kind who has a child that is so out of whack that they're going to die if something drastic isn't done. I've been with parents who had to call the police. What kind of a parent calls the police? Somebody with a broken heart, that's what kind. Who calls the police to say... I've got to add structure to my children's life. I've got to do something drastic at age 16 or age 18 in order that they don't, so they make it to age 20 or age 23. As a pastor, I could have conversations with the folks having those difficult moments and being judged by everyone around them. You see, the Bible says in Galatians 6, you who are spiritual, restore a one who's caught in temptation with a spirit of gentleness. Be gentle. But people need to reap what they sow. And it is hard, 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 hard to figure out when you're codependent enabling somebody and when you need to let them face the pain. It is hard. Am I doing too much or am I not doing enough? Is it one more thing I'd get involved in and they'd finally get help or is this one of those moments that I've been overhelping? It is hard to figure it out. I think the Bible offers this idea that every person needs to carry their own load and yet we carry each other's burdens. And part of adding structure is saying, you know, have I been carrying somebody else's load and, and I cannot keep supporting this habit? I cannot keep subsidizing this rebellion. God says that to a prophet by the name of Hosea. He had a, a family member who was just going off the deep end and he said, Hosea, stop giving that person money. You're subsidizing their rebellion. Add structure. Take away benefits so they can come to the end of themselves. These are tough conversations 
But you're gonna hear other people say, well, it's never okay to do that, it's never right to do that. But often it is, and often those are tough conversations we have to make, we have to add structure. I had a family member recently this year here at our church who said they'd taken their daughter who was struggling with, with suicide and, and they'd gone to the counselor. The counselor said, no, this is serious. I mean, this is like, whoa, warning, warning, warning. This is like, we're, we're not like a little depressed, we're way off. He said, enough that for the next three weeks she wasn't allowed to do anything alone. I go to the bathroom alone, mom was with her. He says, you're gonna hate me for three weeks, but you're gonna be alive. And as, as, as you see, we care for you and love you and listen to you and work with counselors, we're, we're, it's gonna be a phase, a temporary phase, but I want you to know I love you enough to impose structure on you because you're in danger right now. And that's gonna be a challenge. But the research shows that structure and emotional closeness is how you'll ultimately produce the most secure kind of children. Lastly, we're all hoping for truth. And one of the things that happens when you're depressed is that your mind tells yourself lies, automatic negative thinking. You begin to grapple onto lies. And one of the greatest things we can do as parents is we can speak truth into the people we love's lives. So I put in your notes several prayers you can pray. Rick Warren talks about this. But it's the idea of how do you personalize these prayers. So if you flip over to that page on page uh, two, it's the second page, here are some verses to pray. So maybe a child's going through a difficult time and say, hey, can I pray for you for a moment? And you just pray and stick their name in it. So here's Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in John, he who has begun a good work in Sierra, will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. God's doing a work in you. He's going to complete it. Just pray a prayer over them. Pray a verse over them. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Stick in their name. Hey, I was reading this verse and I thought of you. Hey, for I know the thoughts I think toward Julie says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a, a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to Julie. And Julie will seek me and find me. And you search for me with all your heart. Julie will be found by me, says the Lord. And I will bring you back from the captivity you're in. It's powerful when you pray truth, speak truth. In fact, I mentioned earlier that my daughter just mentioned to me recently that one of the things when she was in eighth or ninth grade, she just was so irritated, as we all were, at just the onslaught of uncontrollable, ongoing circumstances happening in our life. And I said, honey, I, I just need to give a verse that's helpful to me and I hope it'll be helpful to you. It's out of 1 Peter. It says, do not think it strange when the fiery trial comes upon you. Because every time something bad happens, I think it's strange. And I take it personal. Oh my goodness, life's out to get me, God's out to get me. But the Bible tells us we don't have to think it's strange or unusual when bad things happen. We live in a broken world. It's normal for bad things to happen. And five, seven years later, she said, that verse I memorized back then helped me not believe alive about the world. Hey, things are going to be tough. And God's not out to get me. The world's not out to get me. Life just can be hard. And it renormalized difficulty. That's one of the things that helps you with resi resilience. You normalize difficulty. It's not the life's out to get you. Life's just hard. And the older you get, the less naive you get about that. So pick a verse, pray a verse over somebody, speak a verse over somebody, memorize a verse over somebody, whatever it is that speaks that. In fact, in your notes, you know, John Kirby mentioned to me, there's a resource called uh, makecanvasprints.com. If there's a particular verse that you feel like would, really resonates with the child, resonates with the family member, you can have, it's pretty expensive, but you can just get a canvas made, put it in the room. I remember Sierra having little post-it notes up in her room with that verse from 1 Peter. But what is that, that word that scripture, that note, that maybe it could just be something that they see every day, like the stars on the ceiling that we heard earlier. So I mentioned the red plate. Last thing. You come to something like this hoping for tools, and we hope you have lots of tools and lots of ideas, and I hope at least a couple of things I mentioned might be helpful for you. But here's I want to give you some hope. Because a lot of times you come to something like this and you go like, all the things I'm not doing, all the things I didn't do, all the things that are not going to work, and you just feel guilt and shame. So hear this. God is the perfect, perfect parent. And 100% of his kids are dysfunctional and rebellious. Now feel that. 
God is the perfect parent. You've been beating yourself up for not being a perfect parent or not being a perfect caregiver, right? God is the perfect parent and 100% of his kids rebelled and have dysfunction. Instead of beating yourself up when you need a perfect parent, get close to that parent because you know what? God knows what it's like to deal with rebellious children and children who pick things that are destructive to them. And the God of the Bible says, I want to draw near to you I'm a high priest that can sympathize with you. I've walked in your moccasins. I've come to earth. I didn't just watch from a distance. And I want to walk through this path with you. I want to make a way where there seems to be no way. But I want you to know you're not alone. And I want you to know that I am with you. And I care for you. And just because your kids are rebelling doesn't mean you're a bad parent. Doesn't mean you shouldn't learn some stuff. Doesn't mean you can't try some new stuff. But I want you to allow God's grace to flow over you. That you're kids' decisions do not define your identity either. In fact, it's when you find your security in God and your identity in Him, you don't react quite as much when your kids criticize you. You're able to find a security that's unanchored from from what your kids say and what your kids do. It actually allows you to be a better parent because you don't need your kids to say a certain thing. You can actually say, oh, what what has God done in these situations? Well, when I mess up, He's patient and kind and loving and meets me where I am. And he wants to do the same thing for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open uh, a time of Q&A. So if you have questions, um, we're going to bring uh, the team from Linder Center Hope back up. And I'll have the microphone as well. I'll walk around with the mic. So if you guys want to come back up, and we're going to give a chance to answer questions. And if you want to start the question off with, I have a friend who, that would be fine. I have a friend who, and and we'll all go, yes, you do. Yeah, we're going to talk about your friend. That would be fine. We're going to do about 15, 20 minutes of questions. And then I know many of you have come today just, again, with the burdens of the challenges, whatever you're facing. So when we're done here tonight at 8 or maybe sooner, depending on questions, I want you to know I'm going to be down here. Maybe a couple of pastors will be down here. Yeah. Oh, wait, five minutes. Oh, never mind. All right, we're going to ask questions for five minutes. And then um, John and I will stay down here at the end. And if you want to be prayed for, we're just going to be here to pray for you. So if you just need somebody to pray a scripture over you, you want somebody to encourage you, you want someone just to let you know you're not alone, you know, John and I will be up here just to pray for you at the very end. So um, I'll grab this mic, if you guys can grab the other. Any questions? Again, the opening line is, I have a friend who. Here you go. We'll start it simple. I have a friend who wants to know what that other box would be called, <laughs> those children that are... Oh, neglect. Neglect. Total neglect. When there's no structure, there's no emotional closeness. It's just total neglect. It's, it's abuse. Other questions? I have a friend who, or if you want to dive into the hope box or dive into the things we already talked about too, you just want to go a little bit deeper, how do you do that? How might I play into that? And the questions can be to anyone there or to me as well. How do they challenge? Oh, it's going on tape too, it's a little helpful for uh, tape. Um, How do parents who already struggle with their own depression or anxiety, it's me, not a friend, um, deal with kids to help them who are also struggling? You, you know what I mean? It's, if like I struggle just from a cancer diagnosis, everything that goes with it, and like struggling with my teenagers now is hard because they are going through a lot and I'm going through a lot. So, mm. any tips on that? Okay, go ahead. I'm not sure. Okay, there I'm on. Um, one thing that just came to mind spontaneously: I, last week I was working with a patient of mine that's an adult who has a child that was describing something about anxiety, like oh, I was feeling like I could rip my skin off and my patient thought, like, I've experienced that before. And it was very powerful for her to say to her child, I know exactly what you're feeling. I've felt that, and here's what has been helpful for me in my life. I went and got on medication. You know, I've done these other things. And so just being honest, and and so I don't know if that answers what you're asking, but... um, but really being able to identify with them and say, hey, I, you know, or I've struggled with depression. I didn't feel quite like that. This is how I felt, um, or I felt exactly like that. This is what I found helpful, or I still struggle with these things. Maybe we can work on these things together, getting well together. Yeah. yeah, I think I hear a lot of parents sometimes will say, you know, I don't want to admit that I make mistakes. I'm like, your kids will not be surprised you make mistakes. In fact, the Bible says that God's grace is perfected in weakness. It's when we share our mistakes that our kids are actually more drawn to trust us. So I've been going through uh, hypervigilance um, counseling for the last year because of all the kind of challenges I've been under. And I've talked very openly about it because I'm like, you know, here's how it's helpful to me. Here's what God's doing in my life. It's been very, actually very powerful. Anyone else have a friend who? Um, just a quick question. Um, 
question, like when you were saying that about mistakes. So again, not as severe as like a suicide copycat, but with mistakes, when you're talking to your kids, as ours are growing into the ages where I'm scared of some of the mistakes they're gonna make, how, how honest are you about your past mistakes to not give them ideas, to, to not, you know, again, you're talking about a lot of big potential decisions that could be happening too early. To, how, you know, how do you approach those? Um, I probably wouldn't go into a lot of detail about my, you know, you know, mistakes when when you were growing up necessarily, you know, but you could just in vague way say, um, I've made mistakes. It's important for kids to idealize their parents, and um, and it gives them a, a sense of security. I mean, you can. I think it's fine to admit you made mistakes, but I mean. You don't want to go into a lot of detail about it, I guess, basically. Um, do you all have any thoughts? I would also focus more on, like, these are the things I've learned, like, over time I've learned. Um, instead of, like, well, this is what I did, but um, these are how I, this is what I learned um, more on what I did wrong. Or you could say, I had a friend who. <laughs> <laughs> But I think you also have to wrestle with, would you rather have, between the how your kids are older too, I think you're, you're going to say more if they're older, 18, versus if they're eight. Um, but I remember when my kids went to college, I said, I want to have an honest relationship. I don't want to have a duplicitous relationship. So if you decide to smoke marijuana, if you decide to do stuff, I'd rather we talk honestly about it than you pretend that you're not doing it. So if you're committed to it, I'm committed not to overreact. I'd rather have an honest relationship than a fake one. So um, I don't know if a lot of us can't handle the honesty, but I think we, I wanted to at least set the groundwork that that's what I wanted. And, you know, they, I'm sure they haven't shared everything with me, but they've shared more than a lot of people do. So, anyone else have a friend here? We've got one more minute. So, I have a friend who has children with disabilities, ADD, um, autism spectrum, high functioning, and those disorders lead to mental health issues like anxiety, um, trauma, um, especially trauma in certain situations like taking a college class, et cetera. What would you recommend um, in regard to treatment, a certain program or a certain, I mean, beyond the tips that you gave earlier, those, those three tips? I think certain combinations of problems make college really difficult. Um, ADHD and anxiety together, for example, it makes it really difficult. And sometimes kids get into these patterns of avoiding classes. And you know, in you know, college is very taxing socially. So if you've got also a mild autism spectrum problem, you know, it's going to make it. It makes it very challenging. There is a. Um, a therapist here in town who is expert in that area. Her name's Melinda Bauer, and uh, she does a great job in working with kids who have a combination of issues like that. Um, I can speak to my, my own children, um, had a combination of mild autism, anxiety, and ADHD, and um, my son was national merit finalist. He went off to Miami on a, on a scholarship, and came home after his first year. It was just really, really difficult. Um, but, you know, gradually he graduated from college, he's working, you know, but it's, it's um, just sometimes the expectations of college and, and you know, there's many paths to, through life and, and, and you just take it a different route, you know, and it's not right for everybody, take it more slowly go to school part-time, you know, um, work a little bit while you're going to school or take some time off college, you know, there's many, many ways to go at it. And I think um, just um, being patient and loving and um, getting, getting the support you need is a big help for sure. 
Let me do this to honor everybody's time, since uh, that last guy talked way too long and apparently uh, ate up all our time. So let's do this. If you would like to continue asking questions, I'll ask uh, the folks from Linder Center Hope to go out where the cookies are, and you can ask them questions one-on-one. -on -one. If you'd like to be prayed for, uh, John and I will be up here, and so we'll be delighted to pray for anyone who'd like to be prayed for. But can we thank uh, the Linder Center Hope team for being here with us today? Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Why don't you guys head out to the uh, cookie area in case anybody has questions for you. That works good. That way, anyone else asks more detailed questions or personal questions, you can. And again, John, I'll be up here. If you want to be prayed for, I'd be delighted that. Thanks so much for being here tonight. We hope this is a help for you. And we'll see you all next week.